Well, hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time to see what's making those headlines then with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. Welcome and great to see both of you. Front pages there, let's kick off, shall we, with... The Metro, amid suggestions that Thames water could collapse, the Metro describes the company as on the brink. Here's The Guardian, their headline, crisis talks as Thames water faces £10 billion deficit. According to the Eye, taxpayers in this country could be called upon to bail the firm out, despite it having stakeholders in China and Abu Dhabi. The Telegraph says that whole swathes of the UK water industry may have to be taken back into public ownership. Daily Mail reports that doctors planning to go on strike for more, than, for more NHS pay will still be allowed to do private work on stoppage days. A source quoted in The Express warns that the government will fight members of the House of Lords who are against its proposed laws to stop small boats. And the Star tells us that the King isn't a fan of slugs. We could talk about slugs for a good half hour, but I won't. <laughs> You'll be glad to know. Anyway, reminder, scan that QR code. You can check out those front pages for yourself while you listen to our guests. So let's head straight to uh, Kevin McGuire and Sarah Vine. Um, yeah, but it was about this time last night that our city editor, Mark Kleinman, broke the news about Thames Water, Kevin. Um, but it's, it's been picked up. Uh, we know the Chancellor's had meetings today. And really the question now is what, what next for Thames, for customers and indeed for other water companies, if you look at those headlines? No, absolutely. Thames, the, uh, the country's biggest water provider, 15 million customers, has 14 billion uh, debt. Metro says that's 80% of the value of the chief executive, Sarah Bentley's gone. Uh, and this is a genuine crisis. Got the government saying it'll keep the taps running. But what happens? Because I think water privatisation in England, they're all monopolies, has been a, a disaster. I think the, the overall figure is... 1989, zero debt when they were privatised by the Thatcher government. Now they've got 54 billion debt. They've run up debt. And over the same period, the Financial Times are saying they've given out 72 billion in dividends to shareholders. So what happens next? Government steps in. Does it, uh, does it do what I think it should really, really happen? It would be hugely popular. Uh, nationalise the entire uh, industry. I think there's a YouGov poll showed 69% of people think that should happen. Water would be better in the public sector. Only 8% uh, not. Or does it then try and find a, a new buyer? But this is a real crisis in a in a privatisation that I think has been uh, an, a disaster. Yes, and one of the architects of that Thatcherite sell-off today said, you know, it was deliberately designed at the time to be extremely attractive, you know, to both investors and and uh, you know the, the 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 British people buying shares. But that wasn't meant to continue, and it does seen that. Oh, there's been an over over generous dividends being paid, over generous salaries been paid. Sarah, you're nodding there, um, and there seems to be some sort of creative accounting that's been going on and a failure of regulation. So it feels like this is sort of you know deep into the mire actually for the water companies. Yeah, well, it feels like someone's been asleep on the job, the regulator, because apart from anything else, these companies have been pumping loads of. I mean, Thames Water has one of the worst. Uh, water wastage records of any company and flooding and just generally mismanaging the whole system. I mean, uh, Thames Water is is my supplier and it's just it's just a, it's a disaster. It's expensive. They charge you through the nose for it, and and as far as I can tell, they they they're just incompetent. I mean, Kevin is right. It's a real. Um, I mean, it's just really. It doesn't say much for privatization, does it? Because you know this is this whole this whole system has just been basically there for um, sh you know shareholders, investors to just take money. In. It was just literally just a sort of they've just raped it as far as I can see. I mean, the amount of money that it owes is just astonishing, really, when you think about it. There's always been a quite, quite a lot of sympathy for Thames. You know, it's Victorian system, you know, the sewage works under London, you know, all a massive amount of investment needed. But it seems to be the owner before the current owners of Thames that caused part of the problem here, Kevin. Um, but, but it, you know, is the days of that sympathy that I listed, you know, I'm talking decades back probably for that, is that long gone? Have they had plenty of cash to sort this out? Or, or do these companies need propping up anyway? No, they've been giving it out to shareholders rather than in investing it. I mean, people pay uh, rather a lot for their water bills 
regularly go up by more than in inflation. When they say it's a Victorian system, well, you know, roads and footpaths go you know, are older than Victorian systems often, and you, you don't get the same complaints. There's no doubt there needs to be investment, but it it, it hasn't happened uh, soon enough. And if they'd have spent more money on investment instead of siphoning off profits, uh, maybe we wouldn't be in this uh, this mess now. I, I think Thames deserves no uh, sympathy at all. They've rinsed us, uh, Sarah Sarah says, and now it's coming out the roost. I just hope we don't see the losses are nationalised and you know, profits are always privatised. It's it's water is a it's a monopoly in any area. So mm. if you privatise it, you would have to have the toughest regulation over it. But it's easier and simpler and better just to run it as a public service in the public sector, well, a bit like I mean, rail. Yeah, the losses of nationalised question uh, makes the front of a number of papers. The Guardian we saw there, uh, the government, uh, it says, has no true grasp on the costs involved in preventing a collapse of Thames water, with estimates presented to ministers and regulators suggesting the company could face a whole of £10 billion in its finances. Obviously, it's going back to its uh, investors at the moment. Um, and the I says that UK taxpayers could bail out the failing water firm, um, which is um, partially owned by China and Abu Dhabi, um, you know, nations that have stakes uh, in, in uh, Thames water. Um, so, as, as Kevin said, you know, you get the losses being nationalised in, in issues like this. Kemi Badenoch um, made it quite clear she was desperate to see this entity survive, as she put it today, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, the point is that China, I mean, China is a hostile state. It should not have a stake in our major London supply of London and the South East Water Company. I mean, what, what, I don't understand how it could, how could, how could be in a situation where China and Abu Dhabi own our water supply for London. It's just insane. I, I, some or somewhere along the line, something really serious has gone badly wrong. Well, and I don't see why the state-owned state China investment oh. company, um, which the I suggests yeah. has been urged to shore up the firm and safeguard consumers. Um, you know, and Abu Dhabi as well. Uh, you know, the, I mean, China has it had it ha had its hand in a lot of um, companies, did it not? In terms of infrastructure, and that was that was the the, the concern recently. Yes, a yeah, huge concern. Sorry. sorry, Kevin. No, sorry, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We were going to ask them to build a nuclear power station. They're in uh, they're in telecoms. Now, not all of it is is uh, is bad, but I just think it's. It's a weird world we we live in, where Abu Dhabi, China, and could have mentioned Canadian pension funds too, are are owning water companies uh, that are you know, in danger of going bust. Uh, it's just it's just a complete not a mess. I can see why Kemi uh, Badenoch wants it to uh, survive as an entity because she hopes she doesn't have to uh, get her hands dirty as she will see it, and she'd certainly be against just ideologically against taking it over even for a short period of time that's just not that's not her economics she's a all hands off that's right economics but i'm afraid it's just quite clear it hasn't worked with water there's many parts of the economy that are very lively and vibrant and dynamic in the private sector but water is not one of them well, the, the Telegraph goes even further, uh, suggesting that Whitehall um, was creating contingency plans to nationalise swathes of Britain's water industry um, as the country's biggest supplier teetered on the brink of collapse. Uh, a rescue deal could yet be agreed, um, but the suggestion is that there are fears that the collapse could trigger a domino effect across the industry, which is laden with £60 billion of debt built up during years of lower interest rates. And it does appear it is inflation and interest rates, which are causing this issue at the moment, Sarah, too? Well, yes. I mean, low interest rates have been a sort of, have been a, a you know, a, a kind of fake thing for so long, and they've got lots of people in trouble. Um, and, and you know, these companies sh should really have known better. I mean, I, they've obviously been grotesquely mismanaged because and used just as as a sort of leverage tool for people for, for the shareholders to to reap dividends and that's you know th this is water we're talking about people can't just not have water it's not to, as as kevin says it's a monopoly it's not something that you can live without you know you you can you, you can go off grid with your electricity i suppose but you can't with water you need to have water it's a basic human right so the idea that that these companies have been borrowing low interest borrowing huge sums of money not investing in the infrastructure because we know this because the thing is full of leaks and is always breaking down and endless sort of 
sewage being pumped into rivers and seas and and now they're in debt and they're coming to the taxpayer with their with their cap in hand no absolutely not under no circumstances well, uh, Thames Water obviously said um, today that it was continuing to work with its shareholders as it sought more funding for its turnaround plan. So we, we watch and wait and see what happens. Uh, but let's move on. And Sarah, I'm going to stay with you if you don't mind, because you've written about this week this week in your column. Um, this is the Metro um, picking up on Daniel Korski, the Tory mayoral hopeful, uh, who'd been accused and denied groping a TV producer, has decided to step away from that race because it was a, a distraction. Your thoughts? Hey, it's like a real human would do. With Speechalo, you can generate as many voiceovers as you want with only three clicks. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a, an interesting story because the accusation is, um, and some of your listeners will know this because they will have listened to the radio and the TV throughout the course of the day. But the accusation it, accusation is is that ten years ago, uh, a TV producer was uh, invited to Number Ten to discuss uh, an idea for a show, and Dan Gorski, who was then a sort of quite a sort of senior or well, a very senior spat actually under David Cameron um flirted with her throughout the conversation and then as she got up to leave he touched her breast and the uh she said what you what on earth do you think you're doing and he still stopped and that was the end of it anyway she wrote about it uh not naming him I think seven or eight years ago and anyway she's now named him and as a result he has uh stood down um and, and it's it's caused a, I, I mean it's interesting because um i've talked to lots of people about this today and it, there sort of seems to be two camps one which is uh he's he's a disgusting sexual pervert he shouldn't be running for mayor of london and the other is well it was a mistaken or a botched attempt at flirtation or seduction or whatever and it was 10 years ago and you know he did stop when she told him to stop and so why is this man's life being completely destroyed i mean what's interesting about it is it 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 it's it's very much a story for the times isn't it because uh, this happens a lot to uh Men it doesn't really happen to women, but predominantly men. You know, they get to a certain point in their careers, and then someone comes out of the woodwork and says, "You know, historic sexual accusations." There's no proof because at the time she didn't report the incident. Um, it's just a question of who you believe. He denies everything. Um, she insists that it happened. Who are we supposed to believe? And the prevailing wind is believe the woman because you know, women are not, not believed in these circumstances. But I also personally don't think that it's entirely fair uh, for someone to have their entire sort of life's work destroyed, because that's what is going to happen to him. I mean, I have no idea whether he would have made a good or bad London mayor. That's that's sort of either here or there. But basically, politically, he's finished. And I should imagine that personally, he's, he's now in a sort of bit of a difficult situation um, because of a historic sort of mistake which you know if you were in a court of law what would it be would it even be sexual assault i don't know you know it could just be a cack handed attempt at seduction but we're a very judgmental society now and you know any whiff of this sort of thing is is basically spells the end for someone um you know a lot of my readers i wrote about i wrote about my own experience of having my breast groped at number 10 uh, at a party and a lot of my readers have written in to say that similar things happened to them they didn't find it offensive they didn't find it debilitating they just told the person to stop being so ridiculous and sort of slap them or whatever just you know push them away it's it's about how we deal with these things and there's a lot of um debate around it it's it is a huge debate Yes, and just to, to say that Daniel Korski said again today in his statement, um, he, he called it a false and unproven allegation, talked about the pressure on his family and his the inability to get a fair hearing for his message, his campaign message, made it impossible for his campaign to carry on. So he's still denying the incident. Um, Kevin, your thoughts? You, you, were, you were making some faces, I have to say, while, while Sarah spoke. 
Yeah, uh, well, well, Daisy Goodwin says she's written about it because Daniel Korski was posing as somebody who's going to make London safer for women. And her own experience was not that. Uh, I accept the den denials from him, but you've got to decide who, who you believe. But just listen to Sarah. Sarah, in, in, my, in the old days when I used to go courting, uh, trying to su seduce somebody, I, I can't imagine at my place of work mis mistaking uh, a signal and grabbing somebody's breast. I just don't get that. I mean, you might ask them out for a, for a drink or you know, come and watch Sunderland uh, play a football or something, but, you know, you know I'm I just sure that was very popular. In the scenario <laughs> she has outlined, how that could be anything other than a grope and uh, an assault. Yeah, but I, do, I don't know because I think I think the thing is that it's it, you know it, I, I mean people's I don't know, people's seduction techniques vary, don't they? So it, you know you don't know he might have got the wrong end of the stick, and he yeah. off, obviously overstepped a mark. And at the time she said, "What the hell do you think you're doing?" And he stopped. So he clearly had overstepped a mark, and he shouldn't have been doing it in that situation. But people do stupid things, don't they? And I, I, I what I don't understand, what I'm not sure is whether the punishment fits the crime in this instance. I don't know because he hasn't had any kind of scrutiny. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.